Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. So glad that you could join us this evening. Our four, first order of business is we are swearing in a new school board member. And so Tara is going to come up and join us, and we are going to give her her oath of office. He can come up with you. Oh, we want to talk. Oh, sweet. It's a Okay, that's the cutest swearing in ever. I'm Erin Probus, the principal at Hornet Park Elementary, and each of us will be eager to share some information about the building as part of Dr. Baer's report later, but we all get to share of our favorite piece, and that is our Student of the Month. So I would like to invite up Hornet Park's Student of the Month, <coughs> Mr. Nico Rowe. Come on up, Nico. Such a hard worker and always willing to help the teacher and classmates. 
He's super responsible and has an awesome sense of humor. Mrs. Reed, our assistant principal, shares that Nico is a true leader and he doesn't even know it. He is always doing the right thing. He's polite and kind to his friends at Hornet Park, always respectful in his actions, and is a happy kid that's fun to be around. Um, Miss Pearson says, I cannot say enough about my, she's pointing him, my little Nico Rowe. He's the sweetest boy that cares for everyone. He is helpful, compassionate, respectful, driven, and always is ready for a new challenge. He gives his very best to any task, project, activity that is given to him and is always there to help a friend in need. I love my, again, Nico <laughs> Rowe, and she misses you to pieces. That was kindergarten. Um, from Ms. Schweitzer, our new art teacher this year, she says Nico is one of the hardest workers she has had in art class this year. He follows directions, always tries his best, and presents his work beautifully. More, most importantly, though, Nico goes above and beyond to not only strive for personal success, but the success of those around him. He is always offering a helping hand, encouraging students who might be struggling. What a joy he is and how lucky we are. From Mrs. McDivitt, his first grade teacher, Nico is such a responsible and respectful hornet. He listens very attentively. He follows directions and sets a great example for his peers. He notices when other students or teachers need him and he gladly steps in without expecting recognition. He is very mature for his age, and he is a joy to have in our class. So Nico, while Mrs. McDivitt says you um, don't expect recognition, tonight we are recognizing you for being such a great kid. We're proud of you and we love you. Thank you. Our next principal, Miss Cotter from Central Elementary. Thank you, Nika, for going first. That was exciting. You kicked off our night just right. I am Stephanie Cotter, the principal at Central Elementary, and I would like to invite Miss Olivia Stennett up here. So the first sentence on here, it says, Olivia exemplifies everything a hornet should be. Every day, we say the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we go right into our daily pledge. Both of us were over there. We did the Pledge of Allegiance, and our hands went here. <laughs> oh, she is so respectful and responsible every day. I love it. Um, Olivia was nominated for Student of the Month by her homeroom teacher, Mrs. Weimer. And Mrs. Weimer said, I cannot even stand how amazing this is. I am blessed to have Olivia in my classroom. She's an amazing talent for being a positive role model and supporting her peers. She is always listening, willing to help, and does not shy away from a challenge. She takes risks in the classroom, advocates for herself and others, and has a great sense of humor. Olivia is a joy to be around and consistently exemplifies the Hornet way of respect and responsibility. <laughs> Mrs. Mercado, Olivia's second grade teacher, shared how proud she is of Olivia for receiving this honor. She recalled what a joy it was to have Olivia in class last year and noted that she's always following the teacher's directions, giving her best effort, and is an incredible friend to her classmates. She stated, while I miss being Olivia's teacher, I know she's doing spectacular things in third grade. Way to go, Olivia. Miss Muir, Olivia's math teacher, also mentioned what a wonderful role model she is each day. She commented, Olivia is eager to learn and strives to do her best consistently. She excels as a leader and shows compassion and kindness to all. I am so excited to see the wonderful woman she will become one day. And last but certainly not least, Mrs. Wallace, also Aunt Tracy, <laughs> burst with excitement when she heard Olivia was going to be recognized and I made her promise not to tell her sister <laughs> she said I love this not only do I know Olivia at Central but I also know her personally she is always willing to help others and has a smile on her face she represents a true leader around her peers and her family Olivia's strong sense of responsibility and respect towards others makes her a great student of the month she is consistently committed to her learning and is always willing to teach my two-year-old at home. <laughs> Do you help her at home, too? <laughs> 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 
Olivia is very caring and shows kindness to everyone she meets. She follows the Hornet way inside and outside of school. I'm so proud of you, Olivia June Stinnett. We're all proud of you. Way to go, Olivia. Congratulations. everyone. I am very, very proud tonight as South Grove's principal to introduce to you Mia Ortega Hernandez as our student of the month. For those of you who don't know, we have spent um, this year really focusing on the seven habits of happy, healthy hornets. And it comes from um, Sean Covey's work and his dad's work on high, the habits of highly effective people. Um, we asked our teachers when nominating students this year to focus on those seven habits and to um, identify individuals who really do emulate those habits naturally. Mia immediately rose to the top. Mia is one of our sixth graders, and as you know, sixth grade can be a really tricky year. Um, it's, it's a lot of growing, um, both as, an, as a learner, but also as a friend. And Mia is an individual who day in and day out is known by all as a friend, a great friend to have. Of our 600 plus students, um, Mia came recognized not only by her classroom teachers, but by related arts teachers and past teachers. Here is what her current teachers had to say about Mia. Mia has been doing a great job of thinking win-win. That's the fourth habit. She has been helping her classmates out in various ways. She thinks about how she can win and how her friends and classmates can win as well. She thinks of others and is always a great student. Her past teacher, Ms. Truman, noted that Mia was always a go-to for her last year and even still today. Mia demonstrated the habit of being proactive by showing up here last week just because she didn't want to miss the board meeting. <laughs> Mia has a mom who's working very hard right now and a stepfather who just had recent surgery and yet she's here because of her commitment and the commitment of her family. So please join me in congratulating Mia Ortega Fernandez. Thank you, and, and glad to be here this evening. Uh, before we get to our student of the month, I would like to recognize and introduce um, our new choir director, Ms. Christy Billings. She is, uh, we are super excited to have her. Um, so she is gonna be transitioning over here in about a week or so now. So um, our kids are really, really excited uh, to get to know her, and, and we are as well. So. Thank you for coming tonight. Eli, if you wouldn't mind coming up. So Eli Rice is an eighth grader for us, and I just have to start off by saying um, really, really proud of this young man. Uh, he has come a long way since seventh grade year, um, and the person that is recognizing you is Mrs. Solar. And Mrs. Solar has been with him for a long time, uh, several, several years. And she had a lot of great things to say about you, Eli. She said that you have gotten off to a great start this year, passing all of your classes, including having A's in classes. Said that you were working diligently and asking questions as well as participating in class. Even though the work is hard, he is trying his best and has a positive attitude. Teachers have reached out to me to say that they are proud of him Eli has come such a long way, and we truly appreciate the effort that he continues to put forth. Eli has really brought into, he has really bought into a no excuse mentality and being accountable for his actions. We appreciate the model that you are of being the best that you can be, and we are proud to announce you as our student of the month. Thank you. Eli. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. As you can tell, I think you understand why we uh, really enjoy this part of 
our night. So just a reminder, stay afterwards. We're going to get some pictures. Mrs. Garman will get those taken care of. So um, we'll finish off with Mr. Carr from Beach Grove High School. Sure. Good evening. I'm Andrew Carr. I'm the principal of Beach Grove High School. I have the, the pleasure of introducing everyone to Ms. Gracie McLean. So Ms. Ms. McLean, you're welcome. Um, Gracie is a junior uh, with us at Beach Grove High School and we cannot be more proud of uh, her progress and just the, uh, the young person that she is and what she adds to Beach Grove High School. She was nominated by Miss Faye Thomas who's, who came here tonight. Um, and so what Miss Thomas said is Gracie has come a long way since her freshman year. She has overcome obstacles in various areas of her life and has persevered to be successful. She works very hard and very much and very much wants to do well in her classes with all of her grades. Gracie understands what she what she needs help in and has become a great self advocate both in schoolwork and anything else she does. On top of all that, Gracie is genuinely nice, kind hearted person and has been a pleasure and a privilege to watch her learn and grow. Good job, Gracie.
to introduce yourself, please. Um, Melody Stevens. Yeah. Melody Stevens. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Melody Stevens. And <laughs> um, first of all, I want to tell you, it's so good to see all your faces. It's so nice to see you in person. Good to see you too. And uh, thank you. And <clears throat> what a privilege it was to serve 10 years as a staff member and eight years as a school board member. And it just was great. Just best time of my life. So thank you for that. But I'm going to get you up to a little bit on the board, give you some dates and things like that. Um, and I appreciate Dr. Hammock graciously is allowing me to come here from time to time and to, to update on there <laughs> in between. Okay, so I want to let you know that we have set the date. I've talked with the art teachers at each school. We set the art show date already for 2023. Um, I'll be sending you some more information and the nice little handout and all that. But that will be um, Tuesday, May 16th from 4 to 7 at the Hornet Park Community Center. So. We're looking forward to that. Um, teacher grant applications will go out the end of February, um, and then we will have those um, announced by the end of the school year, and then they're always used for the next school year. So the 2023-24 <laughs> school year. So we're excited for that program. Um, in December, I'll be sending out student scholarship checks. That's a big part of what happens every December. Uh, and they'll be processed and mailed when I get our students' grades for that. Um, the Beach Grove Education Foundation, um, because Steph asked me, um, we funded uh, the materials for the Fall Festival booth this week. So some giveaways, hope you got some good ones, and candy, <laughs> and things like that. So we're really happy that we can support those kind of things too. That's a great community event. Um, we also made some donations toward the end of the uh, beginning of the school year to some of our sports teams to help with moving all the equipment at Hornet Park. So we wanted to make sure that we noticed them and um, you know thank them for all that they did for those classroom items. Um, then also the foundation will be doing another ten thousand dollar donors choose grant this fall so that our teachers can still participate with that. That's highly used here at Beach Grove. So we want to make sure that that $10,000 grant is back in, um, in session so we can have them take care of that. Um, the Beach Grove Education Foundation, I think as you know, we host two retired educator luncheons per year. Um, the next one is in December. They're always held in December and May. So December has already been set and we asked Dr. Hammock and Dr. Bear to um, be our guests for that. And it's really great because those retired educators stay connected to the district and to the community through that kind of um, get together. So we're really glad that we can do something like that. Um, so we're really happy that we can support the district on many, many things because that's our goal is to make sure that the, that the district is taken care of. Um, we are happy to do with students, our teachers and the community and uh, we just thank you for all that you do as board members. Appreciate it so very much. I know what you do because I sat in that seat, so I really do appreciate it. Please feel free to contact me anytime with questions. I still have my Beach Grove um, City Schools email, the same one. So contact me through that. Um, and I think most of you still have my cell phone number. So, and if you're ever in Central Florida, we spend a lot of our time in Florida. But if you're ever in Central Florida, we're 50 minutes north of Disney World. So if you're ever around that area, or you not, might need you know, a bedroom to sleep in a night or so, then give us a call. Give me a call, because I'd be happy to see you. But um, we're down there a lot. But it is definitely the Sunshine State. And I'm enjoying it. And I'm enjoying my semi-retirement so much. <laughs> so it's great. But anything you need, please let me know. And I appreciate it very much. So. Have a good rest of your meeting because I get to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Uh, Dr. Bayer? Yes, before we get started with our uh, kind of our academic uh, presentation, what, what we need to have happen is a motion to approve our staff performance evaluation plan. 
this is a plan that uh, we are required by the state to turn in each year um, by September 16th, by this Friday, whatever date that might be, but by this Friday. So we just wanted to um, run that by the board because it's um, required that the board approves it. So this, there were no changes off last year other than, if, well, actually well, there were a lot of changes because of our new TSL grant. But um, we sent this through our CTA, through our um, kind of our performance evaluation group and they got some, uh, gave us some feedback, and so it's been kind of vetted by the whole group. So I'd like to just ask for a motion to approve that. All motion. All second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Good to go. Yeah, so, so speaking of evaluations uh, and kind of that whole observation process and the foundation of our district, uh, you know, we're going to be talking tonight about our academic growth, and we're excited to do this. Um, because we want to make sure that you understand what our demographics look like, what our, how our kids are doing, and then many of those great things are happening in, in our classrooms. Um, so I have this for you today. I'm going to kind of get started, and then I'll hang it off so I can hold time. So just like our teachers, when we look at uh, kind of running a classroom, we always have an agenda. So kind of stepping out and modeling just like we do in terms of our classroom teachers. And, we, and Christy, do you want to come up and leave like the first three slides? <laughs> <laughs> she could totally do it. I'm sure she does. Anyway, I'll have to What we're going to look at tonight are the two data track used to uh, kind of assess student assessment. We're going to look at growth, proficiency, and kind of explain that to you so you have an understanding of idea of where our kids are. And like I said, all the great things that our teachers are doing. And then some of those things that um, our principals are kind of eyeing as some things to focus on throughout this DSL grant. We're also going to provide the 2021 Academic Growth and Proficiency data for you. So this may be about a 30 to 45 minute presentation, but we feel we've got you. And this is a great time to uh, really let you know all the great things that we're doing, kind of what we do on a daily basis. We'll begin with a few of the vocabulary pieces for tonight's presentation. Proficiency. And annual typical growth. Of course, we talked about proficiency and the growth, two different pieces of, of our data tracks. So proficiency, by definition, is just the measure of a student's ability to reach a predetermined benchmark. For example, I learn and I read three are predetermined benchmarks. Kids go in, they take it, and they see how they did based on kind of this benchmark data. So then we're going to take a look at annual typical growth. And this is a little bit more detailed. I even have a little video to show you tonight. But by definition, and the video will help you if you try to process this, but it's the average growth of students at each grade and placement level. Typical growth that allows you to see how a student is growing compared to an average student growth at the same grade, at the same baseline. So the data that we use is nationally normed. It's by for our data pieces this year will be iReady, ELA, and Math, grades K through 8. We have iSprout for our early childhood center, that's new. And then we also have our, um, what's it, I forgot the name, uh, who's the group? Horizon. Horizon. It's our kind of PSAT data, which is new, and Andy will talk about that tonight. But these things measure kind of that, that growth, that typical growth. And those, so these are kind of the two data pieces we're going to look at. One of the, um, looking at these two pieces of data, you'll notice uh, the bullet there, annual typical growth is going to be our key metric in our performance-based compensation. So as we look at that, you know, think about that tonight, because that was federally, the federal uh, the feds approved us as that data piece. Um, so they agree that this is a good tool to analyze student growth. So we're kind of excited about that and kind of show you where we, where we follow that rule. So let's take a look at a little video that kind of explains what annual typical growth means. I think this video does a nice job of explaining it. So I'll leave it up to them instead of me standing up here blabbing.
elephant in the room tonight. <laughs> I've been doing the same thing, Jill. Sneezing all night long. pieces while we're getting the tech together, um, one of the components, <clears throat> let me back up. Historically, you know, in the dark ages, when I was going to school, we had a standardized assessment that was given every year, and that allowed for my parents to know where I was performing normed to a, a really large group, right? Like, about state or in probably our case, because I think if that was back in the day when we took the um, Iowa test of basic skills, right? Um, that assessment gave us a snapshot in time of how our students were doing as compared with students in a normed group across the country or across the state. What we're showing you tonight is that in Indiana, we have those assessments still, right? So we have I read, we have I learn. They are snapshots in time of how our students are doing and how they're performing as compared with peers across the state of Indiana, their achievement or their proficiency scores, right? So showing up to language arts, showing up to mathematics, how I'm doing as compared with that norm. What this video is going to show you, and if we don't get to it, it's fine, is that there is another way to measure student growth which is a really important data piece for Beach Grove kids. When students show up, we know that our students show up and everyone is coming to the table with all sorts of different levels of background knowledge. And a growth metric, instead of measuring just a specific space and time, the growth piece measures in one school year, how do I as a learner progress over the course of that school year? Do I make one year's growth? One year's growth is like, Exactly, you know, that's what we would hope would happen over the course of one year. Beach Grove teachers typically make more than one year's growth for our students. So when we talk about these growth scores, we really like to, to emphasize growth in, in Beach Grove because our educators are taking our students from a space that might not be where others are achieving that proficiency rate, but are growing them really exponentially over the course of one school year. And that metric is a, it's a wonderful tool for us to be able to start to make comparisons of like apples and apples. So we can really better understand where our students are achieving and then over the course of one year's time, how much they are achieving. And what happens so much in Beach Grove is that we see way more than one year's growth over, over one year. So, oh sorry, and I'll turn it over to Steve. I just wanted you to not have to, I didn't mean to. So, is, is Beach Grove atypical in that I was reading that <coughs> test scores across the nation, back around the world actually, because of the pandemic. That's right. So, I, I just want to point that out to not get excited if they right. did come down, because everybody. We hear that trend. No, I think that's, that's a good piece to remember. You'll we'll see some of that data shown and some of the data we showed you tonight. And one of the things that you know, I forgot to mention is um, as we go through this, I put a pad on your, your table there, kind of your parking lot. If there's a question you have, you can uh, just write it down and Dean will have some time to talk about that. Uh, that way we're not here until 10 o'clock. But yeah, you know, Dr. Hammock did a nice job explaining that because, you know, I had the typical moment of it's technology. The worst. You know, I know what it, it happens every time. It does. Yeah, yep. we get it. But with that being said, um, kind of that annual typical growth doctor Dr. said is just putting kids where their kind of where their um, skill set is and growing them. And so the annual growth is just looking at all of your kids in your building and determining kind of that annual growth of your student compared to all the other students in the United States and then also your building, kind of getting an average 
than the average typical growth score. So let's take a look at um, one of the things here. We're going to look at the curriculum associates ELA and MAP data and how that relates to the TSL grant and performance-based compensation. So we asked curriculum associates as part of our grant to provide a five-point scale. That's one of the requirements of our TSL table grant. And you can kind of see what um, you know, these are. They have over, I think, 11 million kids oh, yeah. through Ohio, Tennessee, that all of the East Coast that use curriculum associates as their, their curriculum for reading and for math. And they, the scores are broken down in this fashion. A one is minimal growth, and that means that when you look at your average growth in your building, that it's less than 40%. You're not getting a very good, in very minimal growth. A2 is equivalent to like a half year's growth, and that's between 40 and 80%. One year growth is kind of around 81 to 120, and these are what all the analytics say from their end, so we believe them. Uh, and then a year and a half's growth is between 121 and 160, and two years' growth is greater than 160. So as Dr. Hammick said, as you'll see, our teachers do a really good job to getting that one-year growth. Our challenge, as it says at the bottom, is to get fours and fives. Because a lot of our kids come in with, not a lot of them, generalization, but many of our kids come in um, kind of below level. And so we have to work extra hard to provide uh, even a year and a half, even two years of growth so that they can kind of uh, eliminate that gap. So it's a really a challenge for our educators. They do a great job. We're going to, um, as it is, we're just going to even support and coach them even more. So one of the things that, you know, if you look at last year's scores, based on iReady, the Early Childhood Center at Beach Grove High School had no data because they did not use iReady. Hornet Park, Central, and South Grove received threes based on iReady scoring. And the middle school received a four based on iReady scoring. So you kind of see that just based on iReady, Port of Park, Central, South Grove, and Beach Grove Middle School all would have received performance-based compensation, saying that their data is very um, representative of, of good growth and good education, good practice, instructional practices. So as you can see what our district assessments are for next year, or for this coming year. Uh, but So that's kind of our growth data. So I'm trying to set you up here so that when you see some of the kind of proficiency data that we get from the DOE, that you'll kind of understand, you know, it's, it's two data tracks, proficiency and growth. Steve? Yeah. I have a question. Um, when we're looking at this information and then whenever it comes out, you know, the newspaper or whatever right. tells us how the schools rate. Do these kind of ratings help our score one way or the other, or it doesn't affect it one way or the other? Not at this time. Okay. At this time, the only thing that the media really focuses on is our proficiency data. And that's assessed one time a year. So it's that one day snapshot in your district. And grades K through eight, you have I learn and you have I read three. And from an I learn standpoint, these are, as I said here, the I learn ELA scores in Marion County. There are 11 schools in Marion County. And you can kind of see where we fall, 30%. That falls fifth. Speedway, Franklin Township, Perry, and Washington Township are ahead of us and then the other ones follow behind us. I learned math is kind of the same way, 24.4%. Again, we finished, we're kind of that fifth out of 11. Students who passed both, kind of see where everybody's at Mary County, we're, we're fifth there also. It's interesting how it all plays out to be fifth. Then I read three. That I read three score is typically in the 82 to 83 percentile. So that's one of those obvious scores that, that has declined due to um, COVID. As, along, as are these I learn scores also. Um, 
typically we're in the 30s, which is you know a lot of room for hard work and dedication by our staff. Um, but you know, so yes, I would say that COVID has definitely impacted these numbers. So let's so let's take a look at this. You've kind of got kind of the two snapshots of our district. You've got the proficiency, which it's concerned. It makes your stomach churn a little bit. Um, but I really feel like we have the things in place. We've really been missing out on some of those since 2015 when we lost our full-time instructional coaches. And we've had to work hard. And uh, this TSL grant is just really excited about that, where that puts us over the next four years. So what I want to kind of show you now and then hand off to our principals is the idea of our district data. Looking at that, uh, this is the next piece. This is the typical growth and our growth data. So this is just looking at what do our teachers do and our staff do with those kids that come in at the levels that they're at. How do they get into growth? If you take a look at our entire district, I just pulled off one. But we have reading here for 21-22. When you look at our typical classroom, our average student in all of our classrooms district-wide grows about 110%, which puts us in that one year's growth. Up to about 120 was one year. If this, if this, if we averaged 120 there, that's say on average our district student grades 1.5 years. That'd be a great goal to have. In terms of our current placement. So you see here it says, at the beginning of last year, a year ago today, we had 7% of the students in this top level. Our staff raised it up to 25% by the end of the year. So they had 7% of kids in that top quadrant, and they raised up 20%, up to 25%. Then for the second tier, we had 12% went up to 20%. Some of these kids may have jumped up into this next category. Here, 43%, they went down to 30%, that middle level, or that third tier, and some of them you know, probably jumped up. Maybe even a few that went down, we don't really know. You know we're not looking at the individual student at this point with this data piece. That's what our, our buildings are doing, is once they get into these clusters and ILTs, they're looking, they're, they're going all the way down, drilling down to the individual student and looking at how we can impact our instruction so that they can be more successful in the classroom. We'll talk about that more as we go. And then when the school year started, we had 21% of our kids who were in that fourth tier. So they came in struggling. So that's, that means they're about three years behind. That was one of the main pieces of kind of the reason that we one of that early childhood centers so we get kids as early as possible. Because when we get them, we do a great job with them. But unfortunately, many times they come in you know, with some deficiencies. So we have to really work hard to get them caught up. Um, so you know, that's kind of a model of our district data. What I kind of like to do now is hand it off to our principals, let them kind of talk about their building. And they're also going to share an area of reinforcement, just like we do in our evaluation tool. When we go into a classroom and evaluate a teacher, we talk to them about a reinforcement that we saw, and then we also talk about a refinement, what you can do to improve the lesson. That's that coaching that we talked about. So they're going to talk about our area of reinforcement and refinement, and how they're going to use this TSL grant to kind of work towards that and help them reach that goal. All right, so we'll start off with Hornet Park. Let's do that. Let me know. This is Hornet Park's data here. This is ELA. Yeah. So I think language is so important. And I, I was thinking as Dr. Bear was sharing that sometimes with my 11 year old, Zane, who I adore, if, if we're having a difficult conversation, he'll say, Yeah, but. You ever hear that? Like, Yeah, but. And I immediately hear, Oh, we have an excuse coming. And I want to say, Yeah, and. Like, yes, we're struggling in some of our proficiency. And we're growing kids like crazy in this district. So I think it's important that we look both of those things dead in the eyeball tonight. And so I just want to share how we start at Hornet Park and then 
my teammates are going to um, really share how we continue that journey. Before we really um, dive in deeply, I want to share that when we look at growth, we of course need one year's growth as a target, but our expectation is higher than that. Um, at Hornet Park with English language arts, which is what um, Dr. Bear has projected for you now, we see that we averaged 110% growth for K1 with English language arts growth overall. When we look at how that's distributed by placement, um, it's interesting to see kids in the beginning, actually let me preface with saying you'll notice you don't see any red on this. Our teachers are remarkable, but that's not why. Um, red is indicative of being two or more years behind, and so when you're a kindergartner, you cannot technically score two years behind. So while I would love to be like, we just don't have any, <laughs> um, that gives you a little bit of context. Now we will see some numbers, and I believe that is because as students are retained, their age indicates that they can be years behind. So you'll see a small percentage surface um, in red. But what we did is um, we went from in the beginning of the year in the red category, which it shows zero here, but there was 7% in the beginning of the year to 0% here at the end. The yellow and green is such a cool shift with English language arts because in the beginning of the year, 86% of Hornet Park kiddos were in the yellow, which means a grade level behind, they were struggling. By the end of the year, last year we, that, we cut that to 38%. So we shifted them, not to red, but you'll notice green grew from 7% in the beginning of the year to a whopping 61% at the end. So in English language arts, we have both. That if I were to share with you the, you know, the data on overall reading level, we still struggle with proficiency, but we're getting exceptional growth. Um, reinforcement and refinement with that language um, our reinforcement I wanted to share is that 83% of the Hornet Park student population improved in their placement distribution. Growing in scores, yes, but that means if they were a yellow, they bumped to green, or if they were red, they bumped to yellow. So 83% improved. Um, and within that, 34%, so over a third of Hornet Park students met their stretch goal, which we didn't talk about that. but. We have our typical goal, and then if we ever want to catch up to what is proficiency, they, they give us a target of a stretch goal. A third of the students met that even, which so that was exciting. Our refinement, what the ILT does then, as Dr. Bear was sharing, we drill down. And so we want to look, okay, where do we see a deficit so that we can improve? And we've identified really phonics and high frequency words as one of the fundamental pieces of English language arts instruction that is, it's, it's insufficient. So we have a whole exploration team going on right now, but that's one of the pieces the data told us. The lowest tier in English language arts, we're growing the least. So you know then there's a foundational piece missing or that could be better. And so we are really diving into phonics this year specifically. So that's the English language arts snapshot. Yeah, remember, we talked about proficiency. I learn, I read three one time a year. This is three times here. So we probably, most of us just finished in September, about a week ago. We're gonna retest in November, December, and then in April, May. So this is really the foundational piece of how we build our instruction. So now I'll go a little more efficiently since I've kind of covered what the topics are, but in math, again, 110%, so we're consistent, if we're anything, right, of exceeding a year's growth or right at a year's growth. Placement distribution for the red, we went from 10% to now 1% at the end of last school year. In yellow, that one year grade level behind, 84% in the beginning of the year to 47%. And then that exciting shift of 5% were in the green at the beginning of the year, those two green categories, to 53% in the green by the end of the wow. school year. So a big shift, right? It's yes and. Um, so our reinforcement then is that 71% of kids in math also improved in grade placement. Um, and it was exciting to see the highest percentage of those kids growing were the kids um, in the lowest tier, which tells us that in math our intervention is working. We're moving those kids. So that was our reinforcement. And our refinement as we drilled down to the instructional level is numbers and operations. Um, and so we're just, we're developing a, a school plan with our ILT to attack numbers and operations. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a recap of those components for Hornet Park. Thank you. You know, if you have anything, write it down on your little parking lot there and we'll spend some time answering questions at the end.
Perfect. Thank you. I just jotted down a note. Rick, first of all, thank you for dropping in that note. Our teachers work so hard every single day, and it, it's frustrating for them when they see the scores decline. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that. Um, with I read specifically, um, because that's my baby, you know, third grade, um, pre-pandemic, we were at 80%, 80.6, and then post-pandemic, we're at 74%. That aligns right where the state is. We saw a 6% decrease across the state. Um, so although we, we took a dive, so did everybody else, and it was consistent, we did notice last year it was kids could pass or they were struggling to pass. They, they were not there yet. Um, very thankful, again, that we implemented the second graders, allowing them to test, as we had around 34% pass that test as second graders. So that gave us a good starting point to see who we need to really target for instruction. That was just a side note, sorry. Um, okay, so here's our ELA, and you see our annual typical growth was at 112%. Um, if I break that down into grade level, we had second graders um, scored at 100%, and then our third graders scored at 123%. So that slide that uh, Dr. Bear was talking about earlier that third grade ELA actually scored a four for growth. So they achieved 1.5 years of growth, which again is super exciting. We're not caught up yet, but we're making that progress. If you look at the green, again, I combine the early on grade level. So we started out at 20% uh, at our above typical, and then by the end of the year, we ended at 51% total. And then one grade level below, we were at 43%, and then smidged that down to 34. And then if you look at two or more grade levels below, so all the kiddos in the red, we were at 37 and shrunk that down to 14%. Again, when I look at areas for uh, reinforcement, this one was so exciting for us. Um, our highest achieving ELA students, so the highest achieving, the ones that started the year at mid or above grade level in, in second and third grade, they had the largest amount of growth in our entire school. That's hard to do um, because they already come in strong. And if you look at it, we've got a lot of making up to do. We have a lot of red, we have a lot of yellow. So for our kids that are already at or above grade level, for us to be able to say to a parent that comes to me and says, you know what, your scores aren't proficient, they're not comparable to other schools, I can say, you know what, our highest achieving ELA students grew 141 towards their typical annual growth. So that's a significant um, reinforcement and something to celebrate for Central. On the flip side of that, our area of refinement, like Mrs. Probus said, is our lowest achieving ELA students. Our kiddos that are coming in three or more grade levels below, we're having trouble um, getting them caught up to where, they, not only where they need to be, but getting them to meet their growth targets. Um, that's an area that we need to focus on at Central. Specifically, we are looking at phonics, we're looking at phonemic awareness, um, getting to know the correct strategies so that we can deliver those strategies to the students to help them succeed. We've got kids that are coming in that, um, despite all the hard work that they do at Orna Park, they're still not ready, right? But we can't have nine-year-olds in first grade. It's just not developmentally appropriate. So we're getting to the point where we can meet each kid where they are so that they too can join in the celebration of growth. And then on to math. We were right at 100% for annual and typical growth. Uh, started the year out at 7% um, at or above typical. Ended at 44%. One grade level below was 56% and then ended at 44 and then as you can see, 37% for two or more grade levels below, ending the year at 13%. With our uh, math reinforcement, our area of success that we wanna celebrate, it's our math intervention team. Um, last year, we switched one of our Title I reading teachers over into Title I math, and she specifically targeted the students that were one grade level below. A lot of times in reading, we target the lowest of the low, in math, we decided to switch it up again because it was the first year and hey, why not? Let's see if we can make some, some changes otherwise. They had the highest amount of growth. So by targeting that specific group of kids, they were able to grow the most. So that's 
huge success when we discussed that. She said job security. I said, of course, you're amazing. Um, but it was something to celebrate. It was, you know, we're actively targeting this population of students, and they're showing, showing that success. She also works with the top 15 kids in each grade, and they were the second highest of showing growth. So that's proving to us when we target interventions and we have the right tools to succeed, we can rise to that challenge. With our refinement, um, again, it's the lowest achieving students. Um, they show the least amount of growth. So we really need to, at Central, figure out good strategies to help all of our kids succeed. I'm glad that we're pushing the high kids that are already successful. I'm glad that we're pushing them to meet their growth targets, but we also need to make sure that um, our lowest achieving students have the skills that they need to succeed as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. This is Fleming. So similar to my colleagues, um, our students have also shown um, right in that one year's growth collectively. So we're at 105% uh, progress toward annual typical growth in ELA, and in math it's 104%. <coughs> So we're right at that one year's growth in both areas, um, which is good, but um, we're going to continue to work toward that 121 plus. With the English language arts, um, 22 per, we went from 22% to 34% on or above grade level, 44% to 32%, two or more grade levels behind, and 35% to 34% one grade level below. So again, the, um, as you've seen in the other two um, samplings, our students are moving along. We still have far more in the red than we want to see, but we'll address that with our refinement. 52 of our students made typical growth goal and 24% met that stretch goal in language arts alone. 83% of our students who were at um, two grade levels or below demonstrated improved placement. So they moved from one placement to another on that um, continuum of five different placement options. 44% of our students moved from the three plus grade level below um, demonstrating that improved placement. So what we're seeing is that our focus on our students who struggle the most and who have those identified needs um, are ones whose needs we're starting to meet uh, much more proficiently. I'll share the reinforcements and refinements more globally after both um, content areas. South Grove Math, as I mentioned before, 104% progress toward annual typical growth. When you look at our placement distribution, we went from um, a collective 46% uh, in the red to a collective 25% in the red. Um, with the yellow, we went from 41 to 34%, which led us to our green moving from 14% to 40%. So that was a, a big uh, gain for us there. 54% of our students made typical growth goal and 20% met that stretch goal. When you look at those students who started out at two years below grade level, 90% of our students uh, demonstrated improved placement. When you look at our students who were three years or more behind grade level, 72% of our students um, demonstrated improved placement. So again, while those overarching numbers we see on the proficiency end of I Learn, and even some of those overarching numbers here, um, with our growth, uh, when we get down into the weeds with e looking at the data for each and every student, we see some real growth, particularly with our students who need the most help um, or have the most gaps in their, their foundational skills. So as a reinforcement in both reading and math, um, the implementation of the frameworks, the curricular frameworks that we instituted these past two years are really starting to show um, benefit to our students. The, um, it, the framework prioritizes both access to grade level content as well as differentiated support. So in both math and reading, we have small group support every single day. So. 
um, a student, whether they are um, in that uh, striped green area or whether they're in the striped red area, is going to have individualized support from the teacher every week on their level. Last year, our primary focus as a school, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade was phonics, which again, speaking to some of the deficits we've seen across the state and across the nation due to COVID, uh, normally in fourth grade, we see that as a transition year from learning how to read to reading to learn. And what, what we've seen um, is that that, pho that phonics focus has become really critical for us even in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Uh, so that has been a focus for us in small groups. This year, as we saw the fall data, uh, we, we see that the pro progress has been made in that area for most of our students, and therefore phonics is not um, a singular focus for us in that small group work. So that's good news. We're getting to focus more on the two different types of comprehension. Similarly, in math, our focus across the board the past two years has been numbers and operations, and now we get to differentiate more based on our fall data with our um, diagnostic in August. Our refinement at South Grove is going to be to continue to move students that 121% or more uh, toward the two years of growth so that they're ready for middle school and beyond. How will we do that? Well, we're counting on this wonderful um, network and structure that we now have in place that allows us to grow teacher capacity through the professional development we have, through the coaching and mentoring that's in place, and also with our, in, our focus on enhancing student ownership at the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade levels. One thing that we have implemented this year that I think is a testament to that work is at sixth grade we now have restructured the schedule to allow for that I succeed block, which is a half hour of time at the end of every day, um, except Wednesdays. And uh, students are um, actually monitoring their own attendance. They're monitoring their own progress toward goals with iReady, and they're um, tracking their own um, grades, and that's new for them. So they will actually lead conferences with their parents and teachers in October, and we'll use that as a pilot to determine um, to what degree we will do that with fourth and fifth graders in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fleming. <clears throat> Mr. Morgan. All right, so we'll just take this in for a second because if you're anything like me, all of that red just makes you kind of sick to your stomach. Um, however, uh, one of the things that I'd like to to bring to your attention is our annual typical growth, which is that 127% mark. So um, the jump from sixth grade curriculum to seventh grade curriculum is, is a large one um, and something that our kids do struggle with. So uh, this is something that we, we do see on a, a fairly consistent basis. Um, one of our goals is, again, to kind of close that gap for the red so shrink it and then make our green look a little bit bigger. But as you can see here, um, we started with about 25% that were above or on grade level. Um, we finished the year with close to 40% there. So really good growth there. And then we were able to shrink our reds uh, some as well. We were at about a 58%. Um, and, and close that down to a 48%, which contributed to that annual typical growth for ELA. Uh, one thing I will add about our ELA scores, um, so I was really interested to find out how accurate our data was for iReady compared to uh, our iLearn test, which is our state test. Um, and it, it is very, very similar. Um, really proud of our both of those departments there, our 7th and our 8th grade. Our 7th grade ELA was 4th in Marion County, 8th grade ELA was 3rd in Marion County. So um, they scored very well in both of those. Moving on to math here, Ryan, uh, very, very similar. Ryan, Ryan, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, Rob brought up, brought up a point and so I'm, I'm going to ask it. So. Um, you're red, I know that you're not happy about that. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, is it that the red, because it's growing because these are newer students coming in to your grade level? Are these kids who have like IEPs who keep moving <coughs> up and they keep getting farther behind? Are these kids that we've had in the system and, you, you know, is there a reason for that? Do we know what's breaking it down a little bit? So, I, I mean, I think that having two principals of the middle school could speak to this as well. But, um, again, that jump in rigor from 6th to 7th grade in standards is a significant one. Okay. Um, so when we're looking at this data and we're talking about two grade levels behind, three grade levels behind, um, you think about it as you're getting older, you're, that's what's starting to happen. So you saw that same trend from Central to South Grove, South Grove to the middle school. Um, one of our refinements is going to be to close this gap. So starting to meet these kids where they are. Because you can imagine if you're sitting in a seventh grade class and you're at a third grade level, right. receiving that instruction, at some point in time you're shutting down. So you're not, no longer are you owning anything. You're in a shutdown mode. So one of the big things that we're gonna be looking at this year in our ILTs and our clusters is meeting kids where they are uh, and then growing them even more. So trying to close that gap um, I don't know if either one of you want to speak to that at all, but we kind of uh, set them up for failure if we just keep moving them up. Because, because honestly, I know we don't fail the school corporation, but just if you look at the graphs, it looks like we're doing a horrible job, and I know we're not. Yeah. If a kid's not ready for sixth grade, don't put him in sixth grade. And the conundrum that we get to is we also don't want sixteen-year-olds at the middle school. And that's, that's where it's, it's really hard. <clears throat> to keep from beating you up, and I'm not saying we're beating you up, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just being preemptive. Um, one of the things that we've asked is, and I think we're we'll planning off of having Baker Tilly do a, a demographic study, because I would bet that a lot of our transient population is at the middle school. So I, I would guess because of that red, that a lot of that is probably kids that are coming in, kids that are leaving, kids that are coming in. Early, I'm sure you see the revolving door. And we have yeah. to understand, this is 2020, 2021 20, data. Is this correct? 21, 21, 22. 22. Just 21, last year. Yes. Last year. Last yeah. school year. Okay, so we're still looking at kids that lost a year and a half of in-person learning at a very important time. Moving, as Gina said, moving from South Grove to the middle school is a huge change. So we're asking kids that lost half their fifth grade and the majority of their sixth grade year to suddenly be seventh graders. And I think we're gonna see the same thing at the high school for those kids that are freshmen. We have to understand how their school was interrupted and their learning was interrupted. So I see this and I just see it as, as, as I'm hearing great things. We're going to meet them where they are. We're going to figure out where we can get us. This helps us determine staff. Do we need more aids at the middle school? And maybe not as many as the little kids. And this is what keeps us up at night. I mean, this is what we work work hard at as classroom teachers, as administrators, etc. I will say that your point about retention is important. You know, a lot of times, K through six, they struggle a little bit, but then they're successful when they get to middle school and the parent wants to retain. So Tom and I would have these difficult conversations with parents, and the data, the research, indicates that if you retain a seventh or eighth grader, that in reality it actually impedes their, it hurts their self-esteem. It's a challenge. Wait anyway on the path to wrong. So what we do, but what Ryan does is, and I don't know if he was gonna mention it, but in seventh grade he double blocks math and he double blocks language arts. So they have two math classes and two language arts classes. And so we could have talked about all the interventions, but to keep it under two hours, um, right. they really have some pretty intense interventions at the middle school in every building. But um, I think you can see from the score and that over a year and a half that some of those interventions are definitely impacting. And it is a conundrum. We battle that 15-year-old in a seventh grade. You know, seventh Please grade. don't think that I'm picking on you. I just wanted to know if there's something we could do 
to make it better for the kids and easier. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you keep just pushing them onto the next thing when they can't even do the first thing, they're going to completely shut down. They're going to quit going to school. Maybe if you hold them back, give them a second run at it, then it starts to click, then they're ready for the next grade. But if we keep just going, all right, all right, all right. Well, I think, I think Andy will be able to speak to some of this with pathways because I think that's a, a good avenue that we're taking because, you know, traditional school for some is not always going to be the way, right? So, like, C9 and different things that we offer uh, kids is, is really, really important. So, uh, I mean, that, the, the conversation we're having is a big philosophical conversation that, um, just like dress code, we're probably not all going to be able to agree on. Um, certainly understand both sides of that, so want to acknowledge that. Kind of, kind of talking here to wrap up my section. Um, I think it's really important that we don't get lost in just our kind of the bottom half here, and we continue to focus on our top half. And that's one of the things um, that is going to be a reinforcement for us this year. Uh, we started a National Junior Honor Society, and it's really taken Which off. Which is awesome. Um, so right. we've got a, almost 50 eighth graders right now that are getting intervention every single day to start their day in an I succeed. And there's many components to that. So there's the academic component to it, but there's also uh, the community service component and teaching them how to be good young people <coughs> um, that we're seeing each and every day from two phenomenal educators. So our reinforcement, again, is, is focusing on those top-level kids and moving those kids more as well. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Which typically, I'm just going to say that, has been our lowest growing. Yeah. We typically have not pushed our uh, higher kids. So what you're seeing here is a true differentiation that you're not only seeing low but the high, which is a very big deal with your age growth. And I think, you know, Andy will talk to you about really one of the exciting piece of the TSL grant is the horizon piece. And um, that's a piece that has not been in place. So, um, you know, somewhere in your little spiel, you can explain the importance <laughs> of that. But and uh, kind of I have a slide for it, actually. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, at the high school, we, we don't have the, I don't want to say luxury, but we, we um, undergo a different kind of battery of assessments than um, our, our K-8 schools do. Um, last school year was the very first year that the state has had mandated SAT for juniors. So that's what essentially replaced I-STEP. Um, a big piece of that is with the SAT exam and getting kids, our juniors, motivated to, to, to take the exam, number one. Um, because, you know, historically, it's, we'd have a lot of kids, I'm not going to college, I don't need to take this test. But you do. And, and so getting kids to understand that this, this, this assessment is critical, whether you plan on going to a four-year university or not. Um, and so that's essentially part of the data that I want to look at. Um, so the SAT exam essentially replaced ISTEP as the, um, the graduation qualifying exam for, for our juniors. Um, so if you look at this kind of breakdown, this essentially gives us our total score. And our, our initial goal going in was I wanted to be within 10% of the national average uh, in terms of SAT in English and writing and then in math as well. Um, and this is our very first year where we've tested a very large scale group on the SAT exam. Now we've made some, just some logistical changes going into this year that we think will be better for kids when they go in to take that exam. Um, but the average score uh, the average total score for uh, students at the high school as juniors was an 889. Um, as you can see, state 962, uh, and then the national was 959 points wise. Um, so it, at least in, in ELA, this data shows that students are approaching the college ready benchmark. So the state essentially gives, essentially it's three levels. It's college ready, approaching college ready, and then below. It's essentially like a one, two, or three. And so with the essentially English language arts and writing, we were at that approaching college ready kind of standard. Um, and then in math, we were the below college ready, which in, in mathematics is, it's, it's been a focus of ours. Um, 
And so this is what um, essentially our juniors will take again this school year. Um, and this is essentially one of the first kind of big mandated assessments that our kids um, had taken kind of coming out of COVID. Uh, it was a very um, just interesting time for the state to drop a whole brand new uh, assessment, especially something like SAT in replacement of ISTEP. Because historically with, um, with ISTEP and I learned, like our, our teachers were very familiar with that sort of format and uh, it's a language they spoke. And so the, the state obviously kind of shifted away from that. Um, part of what we're really excited about, Dr. Bear mentioned, um, we, we've never really had any sort of kind of beginning, standard beginning, middle, and end of the year kind of assessment school-wide for our high school kids um, in terms of something that was similar, something that was very consistent, um, and gave our educators very consistent and reliable data. Uh, we're really excited this year because we are implementing the Horizon Benchmark Assessments, which are essentially, um, it's a, like a PSAT exam that will be administered for ninth through 11th grade that will print this out. We'll be able to access real-time reports so we can actually drill down to specific skills um, that kids may need remediation in. And so we actually, this first testing window, and again, this is a brand new assessment. We've never administered to the high school before. It's a brand new platform. Um, and so we are rolling this out. The window opens for testing uh, next Monday. So we're, we're really excited to be able to run this through 9th, 10th, and 11th grade to be able to really get some really strong data throughout the course of the year. That way when we go into our cluster meetings, when we're doing professional development with our teachers, that that data can be, can be a focus um, in, in how we are delivering that professional development, how we are differentiating in our actual classrooms. Uh, the high school is kind of a different animal in compared to some of the um, our, our K-8 schools, being that you know a high school student will have eight classes. They don't necessarily have one teacher all day who can really drill down and kind of provide that remediation. And so being able to look at it data school-wide is going to allow us to be able to really kind of develop some trends and what we want to target in terms of instruction. Um, so 9th through 11th graders will, will take the exam. Uh, students will be given immediate results, and the, the results are very similar to what a student would get on, P on the actual SAT. So it's the breakdown as far as like the English, the writing, math. Um, and so we'll be able to use that again to hopefully remediate and uh, push kids. Um, the other piece, so essentially in looking at growth data, we, we don't really have any growth data yet. We'll have some next year because we'll be able to compare our last year's benchmark to what we do this year. So the piece that I wanted to highlight is our credit distribution. And, and so this is the credit distribution rate, essentially just pass-fail rate. One of the things that we monitor very heavily at the high school is our credit rate. Um, because as Mr. Morgan spoke, you know, by the time they get to the middle school, they, they may be two, three, four grade levels behind. But then by the time they get to the high school, sometimes they're even further behind. And at times we don't have, we don't have the luxury of if there's a student who is three or four grade levels behind, like we will work to get that kid caught up, don't get me wrong, but at the end of the day, there's a, a, a balance due and it's their credits. And so they have to be able to keep up with their peers and still earn those credits. And that's why we have a lot of different pathways that we push kids into and uh, diploma tracks. And so with this data, um, I'll skip that first bullet point. Um, so it, this data is essentially tracked the pass-fail rate back to 1718, so pre-pandemic. And you can see kind of about where our pass-fail rates were in, in terms of, you know, pre-COVID. Now, when 1920 hit in the COVID year, you can see where our credits, they look a little bit lower. But what's kind of misleading about that is that also factors in the power of zero, where we had our kids that were literally at home. So we didn't, I'll say punish them uh, as they would be if they were here in this building for some of their missing assignments. So we had that power of zero. And then we had the COVID Fs. And if you're not familiar with COVID Fs, that's when the state came through for our seniors and essentially waived the senior Fs or if they failed that class in that second semester. 
And so that's why that looks a little bit like, wow, they did better in COVID, but that's not necessarily the case. You can see in 2021 is those F rep represent our very first semester back after being entirely virtual. So that's when we finally got our hands back on our kids in the building. Um, and what's really cool is if you look at the past failure rate, you can kind of see, you know, going into, so we have 2021, which is that very first semester where kids were learning how to, what it meant to come back to school. And then 2020, 21 second semester, uh, you can see that we had, a, we, had, we had a decrease in passing and a slight decrease in failing. Um, but our, yeah, sorry. But when you continue up the track, you can essentially see the blues are kind of increasing like a ladder and the reds are decreasing. And so what we're very hopeful for um, at the end of this first semester is that our pass fail rate should hopefully be near what it was kind of pre-pandemic. Um, and that's just kids getting in, kids working hard, kid teachers. Uh, you know, our teachers learned a lot as a result of COVID um, in terms of, you know, how do we truly assess student mastery. Um, and so the number of students earning A's and B's in 21-22 increased by 33% from the 21 school year. And the number of students earning F's in 21-22 decreased by 29% from that school year. Because that's a big piece that we have to legitimately monitor. That determines you know, whether a kid's gonna graduate on time because they don't have the luxury of getting three F's and just, it's three F's, it's whatever. Like those three F's, like it's a big deal. Um, that determines our staffing. So if I have a very high volume of kids fail biology, and I know next semester I'm gonna have another really large volume of kids who are gonna be in biology, and I need another biology teacher, or we've gotta figure out something. So um, we monitored this pretty heavily, pretty closely, and uh, we're you know, excited that to see this trend start to hopefully return back to where we were pre-pandemic. So, so just kind of in conclusion, we'll start to take some questions. Thank you, Sure. Again, this is where kind of that moving forward and that plan comes in. The thing that these people are working on daily with their their ILT teams, their cluster teams, um, you know, it's a blessing that we're able to get the ESL <coughs> table grant for the five million dollars that comes along with that so that we can it's perfect timing in order to try to really focus on interventions coaching um, providing our teachers the resources providing our principals the resources they the principals get the same type of coaching that teachers do dr hammock and our team are, are working on that so it's a team effort to try and become better that's at the end of the day that's what we're going to do is be better than the, what we started the day at and so it's very exciting to see the things going on in these buildings. I, I just want to ask you to do something for Absolutely. Tara. We have so many acronyms, yes. and she doesn't know what those are yet. And so if we could like explain to her what some of these. I've been writing them down. Oh, for okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Tara's a note taker. Yeah. Yeah. She's not good. Yeah. She's, she's been asking very good questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. so Oh my absolutely. gosh, that's yeah. what I yeah. dropped myself on those too. Yeah, absolutely. I thought, boy, you know, next year when, yes, we need to have just its own work it's session for this. We questions. all have. I, mean, I have nine questions in my heart. Well, and it's 8 o'clock and we haven't even looked at budget. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking the exact same thing. Okay. So, ABLE is um, Accelerating Feature of Learning Through Equity. And so that's the ABLE, that's the TSL grant. TSL is a teacher school leaders grant from the federal government and this just allowed us we're trying to provide equity you know, amongst teachers or amongst students being able to have equity you know uh, being taught at their level so that they can be successful and we're really working hard with that in the ILT and cluster with our team um, it's very exciting to see that i sat in on one this morning at the high school and very impressive and you know listen to seeing the teacher engagement and the, the things that were occurring um, so once a week the ILT team this is like the instructional leadership team led by the principal and the master teacher you know, the master instructional coach and the mentor
mentor teachers they meet, and then the they easy. plan the cluster meetings. So once a week, our cluster meetings. And that's where these instructional coaches and mentors work with all of the teachers. And based on what they determine by looking at data, and this will, it becomes more advanced as you're into the grant. You know, right at the beginning, we're learning, we're kind of going back and introducing everybody to that instructional rubric again. What it means, you know, what each rubric indicator means, etc. But they will take that individual data and spend the period looking at it, figuring out, you know, what do we need to do in our cluster. And so within that ILT, they're really looking at data, then they take it to the teacher and train them on certain strategy, instructional strategies, and then also some coaching pieces on now that we're in the classroom, what can we do a little bit better to make our instruction better? So you know, there's quite a few things going on in that. So it's a, it's a very, they spend a lot of time doing that. And along with just running a building, they, they are the instruction leader of their buildings. That's what this really focuses on. Sometimes our principals get caught in all the other things that go on a daily basis that maybe get to you as board members. But we challenge them, you know, you are the instructional leader in your building, this ILT team is really where that takes place. And you kind of see our action plan for 2020. <coughs> so one of the interesting things is um, this opportunity here. And uh, we have a, uh, we're really working with this group called EES Analytics. And uh, it looks at, it's a, Incredible gentleman named Mike Lunchman, Dr. Lunchman, who did, works hand in hand with the DOE. And he's hired many of the DOE people away, and they work for him. So they understand the DOE, they understand data, they know where the data's at, they know how to evaluate it. And um, through some of our title money, uh, we believe we're going to be able to uh, have an agreement to work with Dr. Lunchman and his team to really analyze our, our programming. You know, is this program working? and looking at some of that data, and then really evaluating our instruction also. So it, it kind of goes really hand in hand with that, and allows us as a district to really evaluate how things are going, as opposed to saying, hey, you know, I really think they're going well. Um, it really gives us that data to help us with those decision-making processes. So that's really the exciting piece as we move forward, along with all the great things that our principals and teachers are doing in the building. Um, you know, as we talked about, you, you saw the passion that they had, you know. We, you wake up in the morning thinking about it, you go to bed thinking about it at night. And they don't leave their, their buildings each day. Um, I know you guys as a school board are very supportive of our team, and we appreciate that. And um, like I said, uh, I had the honor of going to an ILT today, and I was just so impressed with the great things going on. And we, since 2015, we've kind of done it at a 50% we haven't done it to full implementation, so it's really exciting to be back. And uh, if you remember when we did it, we were A schools. Uh, we tried to, but we were a little bit, uh, we just couldn't do it financially. So, uh, you know, Dr. Hammock has done a great job of looking at the district and how we can make sure that after this grant is over, we can continue to have this in place. And so a lot, every decision that, that we make as a team focuses around that. So. Are there any, you know, if we can maybe ask a few questions, but I also, you know, you can talk in here. Do we kind of work? Have the graphic like the other three buildings of what our student ratio is? That's two and three grades behind for the high school building? Every other school building, we showed the same graph. Right. About who was a grade behind, two grades behind, two grades ahead. We didn't have it for the high school building. Right, because that data came from IREC, from our that formative assessment tool. We don't have that. Now, Mr. Carter probably will tell you who's behind based on credits, but that's the problem with high school kind of nationwide is there's not really that as assessment tool, that effective tool in the past. We really haven't had that that good assessment tool. So that's why we did the pass pass fail graphs. Okay. So the horizon piece is exciting because it is that whole good assessment that we'll do in the fall, the winter, and the spring. We start to get more of that data. And it's nationally normed, so it compares us to all of the kids in the United States. And we just haven't had that in the past to be able to make those decisions and uh, instructional decisions. So, any 
other questions that you think are important that may have passed now? And like Dr. Hamilton, I think a, maybe a little addition on the work session would be yeah. good to you know, answer more, but if there's something you'd like before we move on. I would love if in the future, since we're playing with numbers, if there is a way to track our kids who've been here, kindergarten through six, with the others. Because, and I'm not, I'm not saying anybody's any better than anybody else, but I'm curious as to see how Timmy, who's been in our district for six years, is doing compared to Tommy, who was at Southport for five years, and now he's at Beach Grove. So I think Dr. Lodgman and his team is a team that can definitely put that together. Yeah. He's one of the greatest statistical minds that I've ever met, um, a mentor of mine. And so uh, I think our, our team had a chance to be and realizes the potential that he has in helping us as a district. So those are definitely things that I think he can put in place for us. Because, yeah, we just, we just need information. Because I bet you we win. Yeah. flat out say we did that or we're lacking them there. It's just another piece of information that we can use to help them. And that's, again, I think that's exciting. And, you know, I think definitely ESS and Relates would be able to do that for us. Uh, I, there today I have two, just to, to yeah, put on. Did I hear you say correctly at the beginning that in order for a teacher to be effective or highly effective, they have to have a three or a four. Meaning well, they have to have 112 so to 128% just, just, just increase. So what you've got to understand is this. In the old grant, in the old model of TAP, it was based on individual student schools. Right. And it was just math and language teachers. Like everybody else just kind of floated around and tried to support that growth as it is. But in this rendition of the grant and the process, it's a whole building growth. So the math teacher, the art teacher, everybody's on the same page trying to, to get our students to get that year to year and a half growth. We get the year growth pretty consistently. You know, they're, they're, they do a lot of great things. The challenge is to be consistently that one and a half because we're trying to bridge that gap. If we always just get one year, we always get a trillion. So, so we're not going to run into the problem then where there's a, kid, a, a classroom that's a majority of IEP kids that might only get 80% of a class growth, which for that group of children could be astounding. But that teacher is not going to be rated then as less effective because of the kids that are individually in the class. Absolutely. We're looking at it as a, as a great as, as a, a building or a great as a whole building. It's a whole building. The whole building. So those scores that you saw are those uh, typical annual performance. That was the whole building, and that's what will be used to determine you know what's we're talking about to determine their performance-based compensation. Okay. So this information here. Okay, so if so the whole the building then gets 128, yes. then they're a, yes. a highly effective. Okay. Absolutely. So my second question is, is sort of pleasing with Rob and Janice mm -hmm. were asking earlier, is, is how do the IEP kids on IEP and the percentage of the children on an IEP in any given building affect the years behind? Because it, it, it could. It could greatly affect the years behind based upon what's in there. In some cases. But I think with the. Do you all want to yeah. Well, we're going to, but she specifically had two questions and she needs to ask them. And if we have to stay a little bit longer, we have to stay a little bit longer. It's a so, so that's a good question, but again, we break those students down individually in the ILTs and clusters in our team meetings, and we focus on each individual child. And they may only get 80%. There may be a 
uh, one of those special students that gets 110 percent. They still have they're they're compared to students of the same uh, placement, same benchmark. So yeah, some of that okay, happens. Just, again, this is a it's like a whole school, and you know, it's 100 percent of our kids are are that school. So yeah. That, those are just my sort of overarching questions. One thing to add to that too is that the district has really made a concerted effort K through 12 um, to really focus on tiered intervention models. So we have what's called multi systems of support in place, and um, in each of our buildings, we have teams dedicated to um, assisting with identifying specific strategies that can help a given student based on their strengths and their needs. So. Um, we're collecting that data at the local level. We're tracking those students and monitoring that progress very um, intentionally. But then what, what I understand to be different in the three years I've been here since before is that now we're actually sharing that from building to building in different ways. And, and so we're able to really look at whether, for example, a student moving from third grade to fourth grade has had enough intervention support to where now we might consider psychological testing to see if there's a disability. Um, and, and so that articulation across pre K-12, um, both pre K-12, um, has been an important component for us the past few years. Thanks. That, that's all I had. Those Absolutely. were the two overarching questions. Well, I just want to say thank you because I know um, an hour of your time is a lot, but, you know, I just want to celebrate and kind of let everybody know where we're at. I think uh, I know this team appreciates this uh, this opportunity because again, this is what they from six in the morning till eleven at night. This is kind of what drives it. So, so thank you for giving us that time tonight, and we guarantee that we'll come back to this in the work session and uh, be thinking about those questions. And don't be afraid just to shoot myself a, an email, and I, I can answer it, or I'll talk to one of our teammates to. Have them help so. Do you have this presentation like as in a packet? Not in a packet. Well, as in I, I can share it with everybody. Yeah, yes. that, I don't I'll, know. That I'll do that right now. I, will, I was going to do that. I just wanted to. Yep, yep. <laughs> I didn't want to like it. Ryan, we appreciate our, everybody's hard work. We, we appreciate appreciate your work. I mean, Tom said to help with this. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think you have the hardest job. Out of all of them. Well, Ryan, you, absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah. yours is the hardest one. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, I do. But are you embarrassed? Your face is all red. <laughs> <laughs> we love all of you. We have a great team. So. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to buzz through everything else. So, Mitzi, your turn. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming you've read through this, and unless you have any questions, I, I, don't, I will not go through and read this. I do want to say as listening to this, and this is a side note, that I am gifted with the ability to walk through each building, sometimes daily, Some today I did, sometimes I, I, I try and they don't even know I've snuck in a back door, but I am also came from the TSL grant. And so those lenses, I, I was instructional leader in, in five through eight buildings, this is an incredible group of individuals that I see do things every day that I'm like, wow. And I know, I actually do know the acronym because I've been living them. And it is hard and how they speak and what they do, it, it is a gift. And I'm, I'm excited to be here. So that's, that's a side note that wasn't in my notes. But as I'm listening, I'm thinking, you, 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 were, you were blessed with this team. So as I go through here, Unless you have a question, I'm not going to go back and read through this. Um, part of the TSL ABLE grant is the marketing piece, and I was able to speak with uh, Herb Strategies and Allison Steel Design. They are working with us, and, and our goal right now is to, as you know, grant dates aren't calendar years, they're kind of weird times. And as this one approaches, we're trying right now to make sure that everything we put the money into is sustainable for years. We're not going to go buy a sign that's dated 2022. If that makes sense, that's kind of a comparable thing. So we're really trying to get some, some sustainable marketing strategies so that people outside of this room see the amazing things. 
that are going on and, and how can we best do that and not rush it even though we have a deadline of September 30th for some money we we want to put that money in that's gonna it's gonna kind of recoup later so those are those those are a few of those things um, at the end somehow we have a if you when I went to some analytics something but I thought this was interesting but of all the videos yes I know I'm I like the videos um, we had 30,000 downloads of videos since July 2022. And for those of you that didn't get to see the um, printout, we had 433 in Romania. And I don't know where that is. Um, I don't really know what's going on. We don't know what's going on with that. Yeah. It, it's fun. Like, I get the, like, I don't know, maybe they've got, but so that was kind of fun. Um, again, if you guys ever have a question, reach out. I can tend to be kind of windy in these. One thing that, the last thing I'll say that was not involved with, I met today, I was actually all day today, with the Central Indiana Educational Service Center, the CIESC, and they are putting on a professional, so it'll be better than what I could do, um, promotional video, and we were in every single school today, and that was so fun. Um, but they did get footage, and, and the thing that I want everybody to understand is I don't know what footage they pick, but they archive it, and as we ask them to do more and this and more, they're going to have that archived. Um, it can be tricky sometimes with, we have a very small note photograph list, but I will get to preview it and kind of send out to principals and be like, okay, we did get some walking in the halls. Can you make sure these three kids aren't on there? Because we want to honor that for, for whatever reason. But anyway, that's, I think, what I need to say today. And if you guys ever have any the board might not know yeah. is that that promotional video that is uh, conducted by CISC is a part of our member benefit. Okay. Yeah. So we have hours that we we earn as a result of what we pay to be a member of CISC, and this video is going to be from that benefit. So of what we pay in, there are some real uh, Another deliverables. Here, so. yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, and we did have a little bit of hours left. So um, uh, then they also did go up to Mackey Arena and get Katie Gerald's. So she'll be part of that. And each year, my goal is it, they're going to kind of highlight different aspects of. This was kind of like we're going to go from early childhood to like the end and kind of just it's an overall promo. As we dig deeper into what, you know, what we want to see, we'll, we'll tweak it. Maybe we'll have more kids speaking, what, whatever it is. But I am not letting those hours on the table. We are going to use those hours, and we are going to tell the stories. So, great. Brian, personnel update? Yeah. Um, First of all, I appreciate all you guys, all the great data today. And I, I guess I'm, I'm another one of those former middle school principals who, for a long time, they gave up on it. Uh, it you know, the, and I just feel a little bit for Ryan this evening because there's probably a dozen national conferences every year that address middle school test scores and why they drop so drastically. And there's a lot of reasons. If you spend a little time in middle school, you figure that out pretty quickly. But there's just a lot of things going on with middle school kids that cause that. So I feel a little bit for, for Ryan because I, I do know that, and you kind of looked at me, and I'm just validating that. I've been there. I, I know what that's like. It's, it's a very, it's a tough time for kids in that seventh grade. It's not a priority for them, and there's so many reasons why that happens. So I, I won't go through all this because it's all here. You guys could read this. A couple just highlights real quick. Um, we do, Christy's here tonight, um, and uh, we appreciate uh, her being here. And the choir position's filled, and it's almost you'll be starting soon. And the special ed position at South Grove um, is filled. So, uh, and when I put the report in, um, Andy was still working on getting the uh, ELA position at the high school filled, but that's now uh, he's got a recommendation that will be on the agenda for October. So, um, we're really happy that our certified staff is, at least right now, is full. Um, I also wanted just to highlight real quick. Um, at the bottom, it's in my role as food service director. Uh, we, we've been doing a lot of research on the CEP, and you may have seen a little bit of, about that uh, in the news or uh, heard some of that in the community. And um, it's it's an opportunity for us to receive some federal funding, uh, and it's really designed for schools who have high levels of poverty. Uh, that students that qualify for either through SNAP or TAN if they're qualifying for uh, free lunch. And so uh, we've looked at these numbers really closely and we feel like we are right there where we will break even. And then given the fact that we have difficulty collecting uh, on some student accounts that we will actually be ahead in the long run, 
I think this is a great opportunity and we're going to be applying for this which would give for the next four years our ability to feed our kids breakfast and lunch all of our students across the district for free uh, you can get in it so it's a, it's a four-year thing you once you qualify you can get out at the end of each year so we're not locked in for four years but for four years if we apply and are accepted uh, then we will be able to stay in it for four years so I think that's going to be a really nice gift to our community that I wanted to make you aware of so we'll keep you updated as we get more information after we submit the application could we get a motion to approve the employment recommendations? Motion to approve. Okay. All the recommendations All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Beth. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Hammock. Welcome home, Krista Bentley. Did you make it? Um, absolutely. So this evening, uh, we have uh, quite a bit of action that is uh, expected of the board at this meeting because we will be rolling into the first step of our budget process tonight. Um, but Julie provided the presentation to you all um, in your packet in advance. And so we won't be diving into another full presentation this evening for the budget, um, but we will be um, absolutely uh, here to answer any questions that you might have. Of the action items that I have uh, to present for you this evening, the first one is just to ask for your approval of the 23-24 school calendar. Uh, we did formally discuss the calendar with our CTA. We are actually receiving very positive feedback about this calendar design. It's been a, a, a nice blending of um, uh, area districts that we share programming with. We were intentional to get the C9 calendar uh, the Perry Township calendar as well as Franklin Township just to try to um, meet in the middle and we feel like this is about the best that it's looked and in in, in, I mean it's, it's just great um, and things just work out in 23-24 so we're excited about this calendar we'll just ask for your approval let's get a motion to approve the calendar I'm, I'm moving with the, the calendar. April I'll oh, second okay, Bob just for discussion just so we know commencement now takes place more on the Commencement now takes place Memorial Day weekend. This we're going to ask for your approval of that and two more action items. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, exactly. yes, it's, it's coming up. Calendar. Yep, okay. it's coming Give up. Give us that a chance. For, that's for the 23. <laughs> you're, you're awesome, Jill. That's for 23-24, which does include graduation on Memorial Day weekend. Um, but let's take care of the off-duty police officers. Wait, 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 wait. All in favor sorry. of the calendar? I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, oh, I really skipped Okay, care. next. Go ahead. God, I got, I'm so sorry. You're fine. And next up, um, we're just asking for you to approve the compensation rate for our off-duty police officers who are working security at our Beach Grove City Schools events at a rate of $50 per hour. Uh, can I get a motion to approve that compensation rate? Motion. Rob? Second. Jill, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Now do we need to talk about the graduation day? Is this and do we have an issue? So tonight we're asking for your approval of um, a, a indication that was not represented on our school calendar initially. And we wanted the board to actually act on this, um, this date uh, this evening because we are breaking from a tradition when graduation would have previously happened. In years past, we had graduation happen the Saturday after Memorial Day. Um, that was done uh, for a number of reasons. I, I think primarily uh, the rationale for that uh, was to ensure that our credit recovery, credit rescue process had time to be able to be deployed. Mm -hmm. um, with some proactive interventions that are happening at the high school to ensure that students are on track to graduate well before a week in between, um, Mr. Carr, the a team of uh, guidance counselors and, and, and the staff at, at uh, Beach Grove High School have made the recommendation that we follow suit with other Marion County school districts, which is to have graduation on Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. A couple different reasons for the why behind that. Um, it is, uh, it gives a little bit more opportunity for folks who might be traveling on Memorial Day weekend to have some time uh, for um, travel and it also a great point 
provides a hiccup in that families will need to be a little bit more proactive in planning their travels because it is race weekend. So it's, it's really compelling that we would ask you all this evening to really memorialize, great word, um, on Memorial Day weekend, graduation date for this day uh, because then we have a save the date uh, communications plan that we intend to get distributed very soon out to our families. There is, um, we have a very short summer to begin with, right? We, we start back at the end of July. There's um, a psychological difference between when graduation happens and then an extra week for our educators to really experience summer. Um, and, and for folks that can be, I think, a compelling piece for our educators that one more week, so many of our educators stay that week um, to get kids prepared for graduation. So um, I think that'll be a really nice piece for our educators. But it's a change, and we just didn't want you all to be Thank surprised you. about it. And we thought that um, well, this could be a really good change for our community, but, but wanted your feedback and didn't want to proceed without making sure that this action was on your table tonight. I'll make a motion to wait, approve this. Wait, wait, wait. Tara, for your information, the school board attends the graduation, just so you know, and you can plan ahead. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the 2023 graduation date for Sunday, May 27th. Saturday. Saturday, May 27th. Denise. Beth. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Good question. Have you ever done it before? Ooh, good question. Done what? I don't know. Graduation. Not that I know of. Yeah. Have we? I graduated. We used to always be on. I graduated at the end of May. I don't remember that. Yeah, but it, we've but always graduated after Memorial Day. Ten years ago. I mean, I it's sometimes it's well, still. Fun. I think it's in May. It's just been the but last. But it was. Year. It was probably the last Saturday. Well, no, because that would Depends be Memorial Weekend. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a fan, but it's what it is. I'm glad it's not June because I like to go on vacation in the first week of June and <coughs> couldn't go because graduation. So, did we ask the student council? No. <clears throat> no. That, that's the only thing that, that I have concerns with. We asked the teachers. <clears throat> we didn't ask the students. We didn't ask the families of the students. And um, six, six months or less, eight months before graduation, it can be really, really hard for families that are traveling to find accommodations on race weekend. And, that, and that's, that was a concern that I had. Not, now, everybody could mostly be global, but if, if you're traveling, for this, for, for this graduation in 2023, you are not going to be able to find a hotel room anywhere in Central. If that's why we're doing it, that's an excellent point. If, if that's. I, I mean, when we talk to the educators, and I understand, mm -hmm. but honestly, this is for the, the students. And, and I appreciate the educators wanting to start vacations early and all of those things. But this is truly a celebration for those seniors and their families. So I, I'm, I'm fine if we're going, as we as a board decide to move it up, and if the high school decides to move it up, but we did not talk to a very key group of people for this decision to happen. And when we approved the 23-24 calendar, we approved the graduation date on that calendar. It's been added, because we, we recognize that that was a real misstep. So, um, so I just wanted to make sure we understood. We've already voted, so we made the decision. But we did not ask our families, and we did not ask our students. Well, the reason why I'm agreeing with this is because it shortens a week for students to do stupid stuff. Right. That's my right. thought process behind it. I, I would say that although we have approved it, if something happens going forward, that the high school, the students have a problem, the parents have a, Andy can always come back to us and say, uh, didn't work. we gotta change it because it's not working. I mean, there's always a way that we can change well, the calendar. Well, point, because announcements are gonna be ordered, gowns are gonna be ordered, all of those things for 2023. Start to order now. I never ordered my What's, what's the last but. day of student instruction? Is it that Friday, but the day before? The Thursday. The Thursday before? <clears throat> so we could. Andy, when do they start like ordering invitations and stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually around the January, February mark. So we'll have like, our folks from Johnson's come in and they'll start doing their kind of 
kind of typical sales pitch that sends the majority of our kids out of the auditorium freaking out because they think they have to spend $700. So, <laughs> so now that we're talking about this, about um, if night. you feel as well, like Jill, that it's important to go back to the student council with the students and the parents, we could come back for the next board meeting and revisit if you need to change the date. How's that sound? We, we call out, obviously, on the communication piece. We have feedback from everyone here, obviously. Um, and so that hasn't been something that we obviously started communicating. We sat down in uh, our guidance council today with uh, the administration of high school and our, our guidance counselors who began working out like what that last week final schedule. Because, it, because essentially, it, it honestly it puts a lot more work on us at the high school be able to pull off in that kind of shorter amount of time because we have to certify credits, we have to uh, you know, rearrange grad practice. And so there, there's a lot of those things that, that occur. Um, part of the, and I don't want to labor too much, but part of that motivation is because Dr. Hammond spoke of is you know, we had a, a, a historically we had a credit recovery program at the high school that's specifically for seniors and uh, it is not so initially, what we have, what, ha what then will be happens is a senior second semester through weeks in will have a 33 percent in English, let's say, and then that, that senior will literally switch off because they know that I'll say Plato class that that week in between graduation, and so we spend kind of what Rick was kind of uh, speaking on. We essentially spend that last half of the year trying to. I'm not just taking out the class, but I can't take out the class. And so they essentially just switch off because they know, well, those who can play the course, I'll get them in three days. Um, and so really trying to make sure we're legitimizing our credits that we have in high school uh, is another kind of part of this. So will you post the graduation date on the website going forward, like now, so that if you're going to get complaints, you're going to get them starting? Oh, well, we'll get them. If you, if they'll, they'll come to me. Yeah, it's beach growth looking uh, plants no matter what. Uh, I have to save the date ready, but I'm just waiting. Like, it's the, the grass we thought about a Friday night graduation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I graduated on a Friday night. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We already approved the calendar for 22 and it had a 23 graduation date on it. That's what we did. We were one of the only, we were like the first class to graduate so outside. We felt like we needed to ask for your approval of a, a that, that might save the hustle and bustle of people's okay. weekend, but it also no, helps no, no. us to get that week back. So do I didn't mean to talk so about we need to talk about this anymore. We're all good to go. We're got a got a plan. We're gonna figure out everybody's happy. We're I would I would begin sending out if it's copacetic, I'll begin sending out the response to the Great. Ready Andy tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I got two graduating, so I got to be there. So. Okay, so we need to have a budget hearing. So we need a motion to open the 2023 budget hearing. I'll move. Second. Okay. Who did that? Who April. said April? Oh, April. Rick, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Budget hearing's open. So, Julie, Can do I, you want to, uh, at this time, time? Kind of go yeah, over Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, Julie has uh, put together a couple bullet points just to ensure that of the documents that you were provided with in your packet, that, that if there are any questions or if any of it is unclear, um, you know, we want to ensure that, that they are clear. So, uh, Julie, do you want to kind of review those points that, that you've got listed? Yeah, so I will go over the budget part and we'll save the, no, I'll just go over it all because you'll do the bus replacement and yeah. the capital you projects all at once. No, she is no. just going to speak to you all. Yep. No, I done. gave you the PowerPoint yeah. in You the... did, but I didn't print it. I like oh, to have things it. in front of me. Oh. It's okay. I got just here. go ahead. Come if see I, me. If, I, don't, if I can't figure it out. Oh, thank you, because <laughs> I, I can't. She'll just be summarizing. Just, it'll disappear. It'll just be a summary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So That's she's cool. not going to go page by page on the PowerPoint. Cool. Okay. So um, for this budget, for this budget year, um, there's six budget funds that we that we have to work with education fund debt service fund pension debt fund operations fund referendum fund and referendum debt fund and I just kind of bulleted what uh, where the money comes from for all of those separate funds 
Um, the education fund, we budgeted $23.6 million in that for this year. Um, the money for the education fund comes solely from the basic tuition grant, which is the state, um, and it is based on the ABM, uh, average daily membership student count, and that's the only thing that goes into that fund. Um, all of the other funds are from property taxes. So um, there's, um, we are expecting an increase in property tax dollars due to the increased assessed values in 2023. Um, so the referendum fund that was passed by the taxpayers at 55 cents, that should go up based on the assessed value. Um, Rick? Mm -hmm. I have a quick yes. It doesn't have to go up though, does it? It's, well, it, the 55 cents stays 55 cents. It's just going to be more because the assessed value is more. Right, but I'm Okay, I think you're talking about the capital referendum, which is the debt referendum, which was passed at 40 cents, but it doesn't have to be, at, like it's up to 40. So this one is usually around 20 cents of assessed value, and that is where that one's gonna stay. But the, so there's an operating referendum and then there's a debt referendum. So the operating referendum is 55 cents regardless but the debt referendum which is sometimes referred to as capital referendum um, that one is the it it can go up to 40 cents if the projects don't necessitate that it will not be at 40 cents yeah you're welcome um, so the the only fund that gets no property tax is the operations fund and that is because of the circuit breaker the property tax cap so um, we transfer money from the education fund to the operation fund to pay for those expenses um, that was new to me this year <laughs> circuit breaker um, so normally with property taxes, we would get, based on the levy, we would get $3.2 million in our operations fund. The operations fund um, in your PowerPoint is pays for technology, building repairs, utilities, equipment, transportation, um, buses, and then salaries for any employee that doesn't work face-to-face uh, -face with students. So all of your bus drivers, all of the administration in the administration building, um, the business office, personnel, food service, custodial, all of those um, we get zero money for. Um, so we would normally get 3.2 million and the property tax cap is 4.8 million. So there's a $1.6 million difference which they take away from debt service and pension debt to make up for that. So it's it's a little bit hard to wrap my head around circuit breaker, but I've been trying. <laughs> I've been trying. It's significant. We're um, number one in the state for impact. Yes, we are the, the most impacted by the circuit breaker, apparently. Yeah, not number one. Um, <laughs> the rainy day fund, we don't expect to spend any money from that. It's um, it's basically for emergencies, but we always put it in the budget in case something unexpected comes up. Um, the bus replacement plan is a five-year plan. We aren't planning on buying any buses in 2023. However, we always put a couple in there in case something something happens and we would need some. Uh, then you don't have to do a, an amendment. Um, capital projects plan is a three-year plan. Um, we include purchases for equipment, technology, and safety for all of, our, all of our buildings for all three years, and we try to keep it general because we don't know if 
you know, what will come up. So we like to keep it general so that if anything comes up, it's included in our three-year plan. Um, most importantly is um, after the DLGF, that's the Department of Local Government Finance, finalizes our 2023 budget, we expect the final tax rates to be very consistent with 2022, um, even with the increase in the referendum debt fund. So that's about it. I mean, the PowerPoint is in your packet. You can look over that if you have any questions. Um, regarding that, uh, let me know. The Form 4 kind of tells you at the very bottom what the tax rate is proposed to be on each of those funds. Um, and that's about all I have. I do have yes. a quick request, and it would it'd be for our new board member, if she could uh, get brought up to speed on our debt service and when things drop and everything just so that she's yeah we have um, on that. we've planned with Tara an orientation day okay. so each member of our district leadership is going to be presenting on their department and that will include like just the acronyms and the vocabulary and all you know there we speak another language that we don't know that we're yeah. speaking until folks come right. into our world, yeah. right? So thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a it's a great piece that will make sure that she really gets an understanding, comprehensive understanding of just the different buckets, what those buckets are used for, and, and how that all sort of marries together in one general uh, school finance budget. But the tax piece, we still think through tax rate. And, and you know, it is a labor that annually is, is just a, a really compelling component for us to be, be quite mindful of. Um, you know, just great news. Uh, um, you know, we are obviously still in the, the hearing uh, part of this right now, but boy, these two pieces are quite compelling. Um, obviously, uh, the board just issued a bond, and that bond um, rate just came back super low. Yeah. We could not have been more excited about that. That was a huge piece for us. And then simultaneously with our enrollment being very, um, we're, we're so we're just very happy with our enrollment is showing up. EDM day is on Friday. Um, looking to be, you know, at about a, a million, a million two dollars um, in tuition support better than last year. So all of these pieces come together to give you all just a very solid financial outlook for the 22-23 school year. We've been very transparent with the board before that financially in Beach Grove, from now until forever, we're always going to need to be very mindful about the dollars that we expend because of that zero dollar net gain in operations, right? So these other mechanisms that you all have been so smart in ensuring are being deployed, um, they're just critical for us as an organization. But I think that if we would, you know, kind of state of the, the budget, solid, strong, um, words that, you know, I think with the work that we've been doing, um, we're quite, quite proud to be able to offer to you all this evening. Um, uh, I, I just feel like it's important to say uh, Julie is amazing um, and uh, has really um, allowed for us to just have a keen understanding of where we are and, and where we need to be. Wouldn't and it be nice to have an Indianapolis 500 or a Coca-Cola or, or a yes. whatever, Allison. Spe Allison's transmission? Yeah. Yes. We don't have anything like that. That's right. <laughs> so we're squeezing, um, we're squeezing blood out of our hornets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if, uh, officially, then you open the comments for the public, but I don't think that anyone. Yeah, yeah. You want to close? You go right ahead. So I uh, want to make a motion to close the 2023 budget hearing. Second. Bob, Jill, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Bus replacement plan hearing. Motion to open the 2023 bus replacement plan hearing. Motion to open. Uh, Beth and April. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. It's open. Uh, open comments from the public. I don't think we have anybody from the public here. Y'all are the public, but you're our intimate public. Motion to Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. We're good to go. Now motion to adopt the bus replacement plan. Do we need to talk about this? Is this twice? It's 
this, this is the actual adoption. Then you've taken the fee vote from the hearing, you've taken the feedback, and then we adopt the we actual. We closed it, yeah. and now we have to adopt it. Okay. Okay, now we need to adopt the bus replacement plan. I move to adopt. Beth. Second. Rick. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Capital projects plan hearing. We need to open that. April. Second. Second. Rick, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Close. Okay. Comments from the public. Okay. Motion to close the 2023 <laughs> capital so project huge. plan bill. Rob, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. We're going to need a motion to adopt the 2023 capital projects plan. Motion. Rick. Second. April, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay, operations update. Mr. Gearhart, do you see how we went right through that? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed your tour today. Yeah. Um, it's a great cool building. A great building. that we, we the guy that we thought um, did not accept but we've got a guy <laughs> <laughs> we've got a new guy we've got another guy <laughs> Donations as presented. Motion. Rob? Second. Jill, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, I did want to mention one little thing. Uh, the girls volleyball team is going to have a table at the fall festival and they're having a bake sale. They're selling face painting, bracelets, and canned drinks. All the others, I don't think, Central Elementary, they're doing brochures 915 to 927. 
Beach Grove High School cheerleading. Uh, 923 is a clinic for elementary kids. Five bucks, I think it yeah. is. If it, the money goes to the cheerleading uh, group. Um, Hornet Park is going to have a father, daughter, slash someone special dance. Ten dollars to get in September 22nd. They're having Silly Safari Week, 10 3 to 10 7. Five bucks to participate. And then they're going to have Silly Safari on the 7th. Middle School Junior ROTC, 9.15 to 9.30. They're selling cards for local businesses to raise money for supplies. And the high school's having a block party next Friday, September 23rd, free with the purchase of a football ticket. Okay. Thank you for doing that. I think that's a special edition. No Appreciate problem. it. Uh, motion to approve the fundraisers. Okay. Rob, Beth, was that you? Second. All in favor? Aye. Jill, C9 update? Um, I do have a couple updates. Um, we've run into some problems with the Greenwood permit people. Um, that is quite frustrating. Uh, they are requiring us to build, to brick any part of the buildings that are facing 31 that was not originally part of the, oh any of the budget. I threw a fit and said that we should get our attorney involved because most of us work with Michelle. Michelle, Jesus. thank you. Michelle. And, um, you know, because we are a not-for-profit school, it, you, know, you know, more than just the city of Greenwood has contributed to this, that it's ridiculous. And I think we should march in 10 welding students that won't have a space because we're going to have to cut it down that much in order to pay for the brick. No. And guilt them into it. And Mike Metzger, who represents Greenwood, said, who is also a contractor, he goes, I'll go, we'll talk to him, we'll figure it out. Is it it, it's, it's, no, it's not even a zoning thing. They just think it would look better. Uh, so um, so Mike's going to go and fix it. If Mike doesn't fix it, then we're going to, I think, because I think we're going to have to involve Michelle because we're a school. And just because they think it looks pretty now doesn't mean that it's efficient. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it takes money away from the students, and right. it's not Greenwood students. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm a little angry. Um, so we're still behind schedule. On the good news is um, on October the first, which is a Saturday, it's um, C 9s 50th anniversary, okay. and they're having a big thing in the parking lot. They're going to open up the gating area that's been waiting for the construction to actually happen. Um, it starts at 9. It goes until they have the, the last band goes on at 7. They have bunches of different groups. They have great donations. It should be really exciting. I'm going to be there for an hour and then drive from to Memphis, but it's a really, really exciting thing. Oh, so if you're down that way, please stop by. And one last thing. Um, a C9 grad is going to be on season 21 of Hell's Kitchen. Oh, oh wow, that's good. Cool. Cool. So that's pretty good. So if How you crazy. watch Hell's Kitchen, that's cool. That is cool. Brett because he graduated that's from so C9, neat. which is that's cool. cool. I have no idea. My you guess is sometimes watched. this is the newest season that's getting ready to come on. So my guess is it would pop so September. Well, they'll probably find out. Yeah, yeah. So, but just I just thought that was he was a Southport kid, really great. but it's still it's really exciting to see anybody yeah, from C nine sort of raised up to that level, and this sort of merges out of C nine but into superintendent board member things. If you have not gone and bought mums yet, mm -hmm. go buy mums. They're gorgeous. They are gorgeous. Um, ten bucks, aren't they? Aren't yeah, like ten, ten bucks a piece. The five for forty five. Uh -huh. Um, I know that several of you already have because yeah. when I saw Bullock, he's like, yeah, it's three board members or four board members have been here already oh, to get them. Thank you but guys. they're gorgeous. They did not grow them sure. from seeds, oh, um, the but greenhouse. they did finish them. Oh. So oh, in the greenhouse. Yeah, they're beautiful. So, Huge. Well, they're, we always buy them from a, yep, a softball fundraiser. So. Do, oh. we, do we know what the uh, hours are for the greenhouse? Um, Saturday. Saturday from 10, 10 until... Two yeah. or ten the flyer. Okay. Yeah. So, they're day. They're just. Uh, the yeah. Like this big. They're huge. You know, they'll be there. So just, they're gorgeous. It's he nice. said that he would sell them to. Like if he made arrangements. Yeah. If you wanted to pop by just during the day or something. Okay. Um, 
board member or superintendent success stories quickly yes <laughs> if quickly. you have any i just we wanted do. to remind that the next board meeting is on a weird day it's on the fourth because of fall break so it's october the fourth for the next board meeting it's a tuesday okay. yep it's the tuesday before we would normally meet because okay. that is fall break okay Bob? one success yes uh, Steph's son and my daughter are going to be in the homecoming court for King and Queen. Woohoo! Congratulations! <laughs> so yeah. fun. No, they're not walking and, together. Yeah. We're like, you guys can't walk together? What the heck? Well, we, got, we make deals with other people. Like, <laughs> That's adorable. Rick? It was a really voting process as well, so if you try to throw us the red flag. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so we did hold graduation at the end of May. And I love it. <laughs> Did your mom? Did you? Oh, you. Oh, wow. The diploma you have. And fall festival next week. Fall yes. festival yeah. is next week. It starts next week. It starts Wednesday. 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 Wednes